Being concise and to the point with your assessments when patients are critical is a must. It helps direct treatment and affects outcomes. I know when I was a new ER nurse, I felt like I was very slow with my assessments. But over time, the more I did them, the more confident and faster I became. So I put together what I've learned from assessing critical respiratory patients to help you build confidence and competence. And just remember that no ER nurse handles emergency situations perfectly, especially when you're new. So don't be so hard on yourself and just take it day by day. So in this video, you're going to learn the important questions we need to ask, the daily conditions we must watch out for, how to keep your assessments concise and to the point, and how to evaluate critical patients when time is crucial. And finally, you're going to get out of this video the key basics of interpreting findings. Now, let's get started. So why should we be good with our assessments? Well, essentially, we're trying to rule out or look for diseases that are deadly. We are trying to differentiate patients who are sick versus not sick. Therefore, your assessment skills are important because you're busy, you have many things to do, and you need to figure out who deserves the most of your time. So again, going back to prioritization. So the goal is to be quick and concise. You should eventually get to the point where you're in and out of a room in five minutes. But of course, in this time, you will find out if your patient is sick. And if they are sick, then you will be devoting more time to them. One point I want to make is that although we are only talking about assessments here, it is very important for you to know that a lot of the times assessments and treatments slash interventions will be occurring at the same time. So you'll be assessing your patients while pointing them on oxygen, uh, doing stuff like that, and you'll be doing it together. A lot of the times you're uh, going to be working as, as a team, so it may be someone else assessing while you're doing or someone's doing while you're assessing. And then another important point that I want to address is a comment that was made on a previous video that I make it seem like we have to know a lot and do a lot. Well, at the end of the day, we do because the more we know, the better we are for our patients, the safer a nurse we are. And essentially, the more knowledgeable and confident we are, the better we can help treat our patients and get them feeling better, right? And at the end of the day, we just don't blindly follow orders because if you do that without exercising any type of critical thinking, you're eventually going to be hurting someone someday and perhaps putting your own nursing lessons on the line. And we don't want that. Okay, so what are we trying to answer when we are doing a respiratory assessment? The organ system we are focusing on is the respiratory system. So we're focusing on the lungs. So we are trying to figure out if adequate gas exchange is occurring and gas exchange is determined by a fine balance between ventilation and capillary blood flow so the first part of the assessment is the visual assessment otherwise known as the first or initial impression i like to call it the visual vital signs here we are simply looking at the patient and determining if they look sick things we need to be looking out for are obvious respiratory distress, which includes an increased respiratory rate or a decreased respiratory rate, use of accessory muscles, positioning like tripoding. Do you hear audible strider or whizzing? Do you see visible swelling of the lips or the tongue? And simply, if the patient is unable to speak, you know that the patient is, is, is in severe respiratory distress. Again, you can tell all of this from the door of the room, which is why it's known as the visual assessment. Another obvious is if EMS comes in and they are already bagging the patient, that tells you, hey, this patient is very sick. We are going to have to devote a lot of time to them and let's get to it, right? Know that EMS will give you a report and nine times out of 10, the report will be very thorough. They got history from family. They got history from whoever was on scene. They saw medications and usually a very thorough, good report, right? But there's also times when perhaps in the heat of the moment, they weren't ever able to gather history for the patient or they were just so focused on keeping the patient alive that the report may not be as thorough as you want, right? So it's going to be up to you and the team to figure out what's going on with your patient. So up to you the doctors, the RTs, other nurses to piece everything together and figure out what's going on with your patient. As we've discussed in other videos, 
while the patient is being connected onto the monitor where you're going to get your vitals like blood pressure, your heart rate, your SpO2, you're going to have to multitask. You may be doing all of this by yourself or you're going to have the help of others. Again, also nine times out of 10, you're going to be working in a team, right? Everyone's going to come to your to help with patients who are extremely sick. But there have been times where the ER is just so busy. There's so many sick patients everywhere that you might be on your own, at least for the first few minutes. So you have to be able to little by little um, multitask and get things done, which is doing and then assessing at the same time. Right. But know that while you're training, you're going to have your preceptor with you. So it's important that you learn as much as you can from them. Ask all the questions that you can ask questions to your RTs, to other nurses, to doctors, ask questions because it's the time that you should be learning as much as you can. Right. Um, so you can formulate your own process, your own thinking um, and that kind of stuff. So if the patient isn't in severe respiratory distress and is able to speak, we're going to gather most of our information from them. So I find it simply that by asking the patient what brings you to the ER today or how can we help, most patients will provide you with all the information you need. Although sometimes you may have to guide the patients toward the important things that matter. So you can begin by asking the A&L questions. What is your name? What year is it? Where are you? What brought you to the ER? These essentially tell you that the patient is having adequate gas exchange and perfusion to the brain at this moment in time and is able to think and recall. So next, you're going to go and ask about the specifics. When did your shortness of breath start? Or when did your difficulty breathing start? What were you doing? For example, were you just sitting down or was it with activity? Was it sudden? And then asking these questions, especially about sudden, makes you think of things like a pulmonary embolism or like a spontaneous pneumothorax. On a side note, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of patients who are tall and skinny come in with just spontaneous pneumos. So keep that at the back of your mind. If you have a patient coming in who's tall, skinny, and said, hey, I don't know where, I just started feeling really short of breath. Just keep it at the back of your mind. Possible spontaneous pneumo, right? And then we're going to ask, is the shortness of breath gradual? And this makes you think of things like C, uh, like pneumonia or like an exacerbation, whether it's like CHF exacerbation or like a COPD exacerbation. And it was little by little getting worse. Ask, do they experience shortness of breath or a sensation of drowning when they're laying down or with activity, which again also leads you to a cardiac issue or perhaps even like an issue of like anemia, right? Ask if they have a cough, ask if it's productive. Um, if it is productive, what color is it? Also ask about fevers and chills. Here we ask these questions because we're looking for an, an infectious source, right? So they're short of breath, they've had a cough, it's productive, they've had fevers and chills, then you kind of lead towards like a pneumonia route. Then we're gonna go into the medical history, especially respiratory history, like COPD, asthma, prior PEs and DVTs, and then we're going to go asking about the cardiac history. And there's and these two go hand in hand because they're so just so tied together. So we ask about both of them almost at the same time. And then we ask about other medical history, right? Ask if this has ever happened before. So has this shortness of breath happened before? What were they told? What was done for them? And if these symptoms feel like the, uh, the so if they have a COPD and they've had COPD exacerbations in the past, ask, hey, do these symptoms feel like previous COPD exacerbations? And if they do, it kind of leads you towards the right, um, the right reason for why or the right cause for why the patient is feeling this way. But you still have to keep in mind that just because it feels the same, it doesn't guarantee that there's nothing else going on. So you have to keep track of that as well, looking, looking for and ruling out other things as well. You can ask things like, have you been on a recent airplane ride, right? Or a long car ride where you've been sitting for a long time. And then this again focuses on looking for a pulmonary embolism, which probably started as a DVT, right? Um, ask about current medications, keeping note of medications like albuterol and other inhalants. Ask about medications like Lasix for CHF. And are they even taking them? Did they run out? They can't afford them or they just chose not to take them, right? Ask if they smoke or if they used to smoke. Smokers tend to get lung damage over time, so they're more at risk of pulmonary complications. Um, and then finally, go into your physical assessment, the ABCs, listening to the lungs, noting air movement, looking for edema, JVD. On the next slides, we're going to be going over how to do an assessment and 
on a patient who is in severe respiratory distress and they can't speak to us. Now let's go into the assessment of a patient with severe respiratory distress and essentially they can't speak to us, right? So remember that you will be treating while you're assessing. You're part of a team, so it may be your provider assessing while you're the one playing. Or in other words, you're the one doing and implementing the interventions, meaning you're going to be the one placing the patient on the cardiac monitor, obtaining your vital signs, placing the patient on oxygen, obtaining IV access, et cetera, et cetera. So your initial impression, visual vitals, will tell you that this patient is sick. If it's just you, first, place the patient on the pulse ox, then listen to their lungs, noting if there is air movement, because if the patient is working really hard to breathe, but there is an air movement, the patient will go into respiratory failure very shortly. So pay attention to the fine details when you listen to the lungs, if possible for wrong eye, crackles, wheezing, strider, um, but definitely just focusing on just is, is there air movement with such a uh, rapid breathing, uh, f like forceful, very effort uh, breathing, right? Um, and then after that, go into your and into connecting your patient onto the rest of the cardiac monitor, which includes the cardiac leads and getting up blood pressure. And then again, note their effort. Do you see retractions? Do you see eco chest rise and fall? Do you, does a, is a patient in any specific positioning? Are they tripoding? How is their skin color? How is their alertness? So if mentation is declining, respiratory failure is pretty much imminent, right? So, and then go into looking for edema to the lower extremities, to the abdomen, the upper extremities. Is it possibly CHF or like a liver failure type of thing? At least maybe you're getting in the hint that the patient has fluid in the lungs, right? Do you see any vomit around the face or on the clothing, singling perhaps patient aspirated? Do you see edema or swelling of the lips and the tongue, which will kind of lead you towards an anaphylactic reaction? And then as far as the vital signs, if the patient is super tacky, then possibly the patient has a PE, right? If the patient is super tacky in a fever, then the patient maybe have might have pneumonia, right? So if the SpO2 is not improving, then does the patient need to be intubated or on BiPAP, right? Keeping in mind that for BiPAP and CPAP, mentation needs to be intact so patient can protect their own, or their own airway. Then after assessment and interventions, um, after those are underway, you can start by history gathering, right? You can ask again EMS if they got more. You can ask family if they're there. You can ask the patient if they're getting better or you can go and do a chart review. By the way, I put the essentials of what I've learned as an ER nurse into our resources. I created them to help you save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER. They are packed with everything you need, including emergency fundamentals, practice questions, real scenarios, charting essentials, and practical tips to help you feel confident and prepared in the ER. You'll find the links in the pinned comment and description below. Some of the most important things for an ER nurse or to do your best to stay calm because if you become nervous, you become anxious and you're not calm anymore, then it's going to transfer onto your patient and they're going to feel even worse, right? So I think the best ER nurse is one that is speedy, is concise and is quick, but has a calm type of demeanor to them because they're getting things done, but they're not stressing out their patients, right? Um, and then some other basic stuff, right, that I'm sure you're aware of, but just to kind of just touch is if the patient is in, in severe respiratory distress or even in respiratory distress, um, keep the head of the bed up, right? Don't don't have him flat. Just keep the head of the bed up. I only say that because I've had some new grads uh, just not do that and just wanted to uh, mention it here. And then other stuff is to notify your RT, to notify your provider, let them know that you have a patient there who's very sick. Because a lot of the times, like they may just not know some of the times in some ERs, EMS will just be allowed to roll in. And there's been times where I haven't been given a heads up. Hey, you have a sick patient coming your way. And they kind of just walk, walk into the unit doors and you had time to play, right? So notify your RT, notify your provider that, they're, that the patient is there. And then when in doubt for a sick patient, just remember the the word OMI or OMI essentially kind of just stands for oxygen monitor and place an IV right that's like your fundamental stuff that you can do when in doubt um, at least till till help comes for uh, to help you right put the patient on a non rebreather get him on the monitor so you can get your vital signs like your SpO2 your heart rate you can get a basic rhythm up there uh, and 
your and just get that going right and then put an iv because with an iv if you have to give fluids medications to intubate uh pressors etc cetera, etc cetera, you'll be able to do that right fun fact here with pressors most pressors um you're able to run in peripherally but ver for a very short amount of time right so let's say patient is super sick and you have no other type of iv access only peripheral iv access hey tell your provider hey can i start these pressors peripherally and it's just kind of in the meantime while they put in the central line right and of course try to put them in like in the ac or higher if they, you put them in the hand and they extravis they uh it can just lead to more stuff if they get out of the vein right so but yeah uh you can do that with pressors and then let's see and then now at the bottom i kind of just listed some of the things that you got to be watching out for as an ear nurse or like asthma and copd exacerbations uh pe's pneumothorax anaphylaxis something like obstruction uh pneumonia you're gonna be watching out for chf and like acs because they are hand in hand with the respiratory assessment and then just know that bedside ultrasound by your provider can help rule out a lot of these so if you have someone who is very um they're just very capable with capable with the ultrasound they can rule out a lot of these Thank you for watching, and if you want to continue learning, please check out our other videos. And don't forget to continue reviewing outside of work, especially when you're new, because the more you know, the safer an ER nurse you are. And like always, teamwork makes the dream work, and here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.